So today, to celebrate the physics and the physics which comes out of Salam's work, we, we have uh, we are very gracious to have uh, with us Professor David Kaplan with us, who is a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Washington. Uh, he did his PhD from, from Harvard University in 85, uh, then followed up with a postdoc at Harvard and a faculty position at University of California, San Diego. Uh, later on, he joined Institute for Nuclear Theory at University of Washington, where he, he is currently a senior fellow and a professor at the university. Uh, his research interests are uh, quantum field theory, particle physics, cosmology, and nuclear particle physics. Uh, but today he would talk to us about uh, some aspect of physics which is based on chirality, specifically chirality of fermions, which is a kind of quantum particle. Uh, I won't go much into the detail, but uh, let's welcome Professor David Kaplan. <laughs> to hear from him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor. Uh, this is my first uh, occasion to come to Pakistan. Uh, it's really been a great pleasure to see this uh, fantastic university and meet all the great students and faculty here. It's also a really great honor to be associated with uh, Salam in any way. He's really one of the greatest minds and. Uh, in particle physics, which is my own field, and uh, it's really uh, a great uh, occasion to remember him. I didn't know him, but I had the occasion to meet him when I was 22. I'd taken a year off after my undergraduate education and had spent a year in Europe, and uh, I attended this uh, uh, school for physics students at Trieste, where he was uh, running the institute there. And uh, I would, uh, he greeted us, and I met him there. But uh, the subject of the school was on supersymmetry, which is a symmetry that was discovered in the 1970s, a hypothetical symmetry that relates uh, uh, particles called fermions, which, have, which is what matter is made out of, to particles called bosons, which light and gravity and everything is made out of. So it's a very interesting symmetry. But when people discovered it, it was extremely difficult to work with, and there were only a few examples that anybody had been able to work out. Uh, that showed the symmetry, that people wanted to know, how do you make more interesting theories that have the symmetry? And uh, so one of the things I learned at the school was I, I read through this paper that Salam wrote with his collaborator uh, Strathby, and it described how to construct any type of supersymmetric theory you wanted, and it, it just completely broke open the field, where people could now discuss supergravity and, and theories that uh, had, had uh, complicated forces that looked like, more like the real world than the toy models that had been discussed previously. And it's a very long paper, very technical, and it just completely changed the field. And I was just blown away reading it as a student uh, by the intellect that it represented. So he's one of my heroes. So um, I run a public lecture series on physics at the University of Washington, and it's always very nerve-wracking to select a speaker because it's not everybody's a good speaker, but there is a good formula for getting a pop good popular lecture. It should be on cosmology or black holes or time. <laughs> That's what everybody likes. Okay? Um, and in fact, when I was a young man and I wanted to start a conversation with the person sitting next to me on an airplane, I discovered it's not very good to start off by saying you're a physicist. It's much better to say you're a cosmologist. <laughs> but, and I know, I know something about cosmology. A friend of mine got in trouble by saying he was an airplane pilot, and unfortunately the woman sitting next to him was an airplane pilot, so that didn't work out so well. <laughs> anyway, so today I decided, however, not to talk about black holes, cosmology, or time. I um, set myself a difficult task. I wanted to talk about um, a property of particles that has played an enormous role in the last century. It, it's a very long story. People keep, keep on discovering more things about it. And it also played a big role in Salam's work. Um, however, it's not very accessible. You won't find a popular science book on chirality, typically. Um, it tends to be a pretty technical subject. So the, part of my challenge was, how do I turn this into a public lecture, where I try to share some of the ideas and excitement uh, behind this uh, property of particles without the equation. So I actually spent most of today erasing equations. <laughs> so let's see if I succeeded. So chiral comes from the Greek word for hand. So this is about handedness of particles. 
So um, it's got three sort of sections, chapters. The first one is on chirality and parity and nature surprising asymmetry, um, which leads directly to Salon's Nobel Prize winning work. And is mostly the physics from about uh, 1925 to 1967. The next is uh, quantum field theory and Hilbert's hotel. Hilbert was a famous mathematician, and he talked about a special hotel. And it plays a role in physics. And it surprised people when they discovered this effect in the 70s, uh, late 60s and early 70s, uh, something called the anomaly, where things, uh, conservation laws that people thought existed no longer were true. And then the last section is on computers and chirality and topology and leads right up into modern condensed matter physics and modern particle physics uh, and has a surprising connection to mathematics. So what is chirality? So we all know that the, the things around us aren't symmetric and they have a handedness. And when you look at that snail shell, it curls in a certain direction. It's not symmetric. Uh, when you buy a screw at the hardware store, it's got you, you know which one, you don't have to look at it every time to figure out which way to turn it in order to screw it in because we've got a convention. It's got a certain handedness to the, to the thread. Chirality sort of entered science with the work of Louis Pasteur, a famous uh, uh, French uh, bacteriologist. He uh, started his career, actually, as working for industry. He was hired by the wine industry. They wanted to know why some of their wines went bad, because it cost them lots of money. But you produce a, a vintage, and then if you open the bottles, they all taste terrible. They wanted to hire, uh, they decided it was time for science to try to fix the problem, though many of them were very skeptical. Pasteur promised that he could look at their wines in a microscope and tell them whether it was good or not. And they, most of them didn't believe him, but they were soon convinced. So one of the things he did early on is he evaporated the wine and he looked at it and he found uh, tartaric acid crystals. And he noticed that the crystals were asymmetric and they came in two different types. Uh, here are the pictures of the two crystals. Um, and uh, he took his tweezers and he separated them out. And he put one type of crystal on one side, one on the other, and then he dissolved them in water. And because he was a great scientist, he was, uh, he tried something. He said, let's see what happens if I take a, a uh, so light source here, and I put it through a polarizing filter like your sunglasses, and uh, pass it through this liquid with one type of crystal or the other in it, and uh, then take another polarizing filter on the other side, rotate it, and see where the maximum amount of light coming through is. And he found that, the, um, that these crystals rotated the light in different directions. If the right-handed crystals rotated it one way, the left-handed crystal rotated the other. So this is the beginning of a whole branch of chemistry. Uh, that, and these are called optical isomers. So here's the molecular structure of the two different types of tartaric acid. They're sort of mirror images of each other. And many different compounds come in left-handed versions and right-handed versions. Uh, sugars, just many, many complex compounds. We'll come back to that at the end of this talk here. Now, fundamental particles also have a hand in this, which is maybe a little harder to picture. With light, we can figure it out. We can see it because Light is a special type of particle called the boson where you can put many, many particles together and they act then like a classical field. And we can see classical fields with, with our instruments. And so you know that we can make different types of light, which is uh, circularly polarized light, and we can make them with different orientations. We can make them go around counterclockwise or clockwise. And so one of these is left-handed and one of these is right-handed polarized light. And this represents actually a fundamental particle of property of the photon, the light particle itself, which is it has a rotation and you can have uh, photons which have a spin which is in the direction of the motion, or you can have photons uh, <laughs> with a uh, spin in the opposite direction of the motion. These are two different polarizations of the, of the particle. However, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a different type of particle, which is the fermion. The fermions are the particles that are made of matter, with the electrons and quarks and neutrinos. They also have an intrinsic handedness. This was first, well, the modern view of the fermion was, was discovered by Dirac, an incredibly creative physicist who was trying to reconcile quantum mechanics and relativity in the 20s. Because you see, there, there was a pretty good theory of quantum mechanics by Schrodinger, but it wasn't consistent with relativity. So he tried to make it consistent, and he came up with this equation that predicted that uh, you could uh, have um, fermions which have, uh, if they're massless, their energy was either plus or minus times their momentum. 
And you can draw a little graph here. The vertical direction is the energy, and the horizontal direction is their momentum. So this is uh, a picture of a massless fermion in one spatial dimension at one time. So in other words, it's, we're talking about a fermion on a wire. And it can be moving this way, which is positive momentum, or it can be moving that way, which is negative momentum. And the energy is proportional to the momentum. Now the problem is that you know, he discovered that there are these negative energies. And that's normally a problem because if you have a positive energy particle, but there's this whole, whole empty set of states which have negative energy, the particles could go down to negative energy and, and it never stops. It's like having an infinitely deep hole next to you. So he just said, oh, we'll just fill them up with fermions. Okay? And so he said, this is what the vacuum is. It's not empty. It's just full of an infinite number of fermions. And all the negative energy states are full. And so you can't put any more down there. And then we can put excitations above this full C. It's called the Dirac C now. And that is a particle. The particle is like a drop of water suspended over the ocean. Or you can make a bubble in the ocean, and that is a new type of particle that no one had ever suspected before. That's an antiparticle. So for the electron, the antiparticle is called the positron. So he predicted its existence, and within a few years it was discovered, and he won a Nobel Prize. If you give the particle a mass, like the electron has, then the picture changes. Instead of having these, this nice x here in the energy momentum graph, you have these uh, two curves here with a gap between them, which is related to the mass of the particle. And once again, if you want to interpret this, you fill up the negative energy states and say they're all full. So our vacuum is a very complicated full thing, even though it looks like nothing to us. And then you have these empty states here that you can occupy if you put some energy in and you make some electrons. Now, a few years later, uh, Herman Weil noticed that you could actually talk about half of a Dirac fermion, which is you could, have, if you had a massless fermion, instead of having the whole uh, both positive and negative uh, momentum, you could have just this part of the spectrum here with a particle here which is only moving to the left, or an antiparticle which is also, it turns out, is only moving to the left. Or you could have this type of fermion which is only moving to the right. You don't have to have both of them. Now, this only works for massless particles, because if you, if you think about the picture I had for massive ones with those sort of those curved shapes, there's no way to cut it in half. But if you have the massless ones, it's like an x, and you can just take half of the x. Now, this seems maybe not so important, because we know electrons have a mass. But it is sort of interesting. And the, another interesting thing, feature of it is that the fermions now have a certain handedness associated with them. In one dimension, like I'm talking about, fermions on a wire, that the handedness is just very simple. It's the direction they're moving. They're either moving to the left or moving to the right. If you go to higher dimension, like we live in three spatial dimensions, then you can make a plot like this. Uh, I don't have room to put in three momentum, but I put in the x and the y momentum, so particles moving this way or that way. And then the energy is like a cone. And you still have negative energy states, which get filled up in the vacuum, and then empty places for putting in particles. Now, what's different though, and this is one of the great achievements of Dirac, is that when you do this in three spatial dimensions, you find that electrons come with spin. So uh, relativity requires the existence of spin, which was a mysterious property up to then. And because it has spin, there are two different types of electrons for every energy. They can either be pointing in the direction of the momentum, and we call that a right-handed particle, or the spin can be pointed in the opposite direction, we call those left-handed particles. So this is how chirality comes in handedness for particles, but Dirac had one of each. But then Biol comes in and says, no, you can have just one or the other. You don't have to have both. So you can have just left-handed fermions in the universe. You're just right, but only if they're massless. So why is it that, um, oh, so, so a, a nice thing about this handedness is that when you add electromagnetism, let these particles interact. The, the handedness never changes. So you can have a left-handed particle move through electric fields and magnetic fields, and it stays a left-handed particle. However, if you have a mass, you can't have conservation of chirality. The, the reason is because if I run past a fermion, uh, its momentum changes according to me, and I can make it move from one side of the picture to the other. So there's no way I can define what left and right is, because to different observers, it looks different. So it's not, a, it's not a fundamental property of the particle anymore. If you do this in three dimensions, if you have a left-handed and right-handed particle moving along, so they're both moving here to the right, but one of them has a spin in the direction of motion, and one of them has a spin anti-aligned. Well, if you pass this in a, uh, if you get your uh, 
fancy rocket ship and you pass by really fast. Well, to the observer in the rocket ship, both of these particles are moving backwards because the rocket ship's going faster than the particles. And if they're both going backwards, then you notice that the right-handed particle now looks like a left-handed one, and the left-handed one now looks like a right-handed one because the spin is aligned here with the momentum because the momentum is in the direction. So there's nothing intrinsically right or left-handed part uh, about a particle if it's massive because different observers can see different things. However, if the particle's massless, you see, this rocket ship can never catch up with them. No rocket ship can go faster than the speed of light. So the, the chirality is a definite property of the particle that all observers will agree on. So this is the connection now between the handedness of a fermion and its mass. It's a well-defined concept if the particle is massless. So the next thing to consider then is a symmetry which exchanges them. This is just sort of like a mirror symmetry. So it exchanges uh, one handedness with another. So here you can see I have one type of, this is a normal screw that you could buy at your, at your uh, hardware store, and this is its mirror image, which you won't find there. So the world is not symmetric under this transformation. We only have this type of screw on the left. We don't have this type of screw. So the world of hardware is not parity symmetric. However, at the particle level, parity is a symmetry which exchanges left and right-handed fermions, and Dirac's theory had both. So he says the electron has a left-handed part and right-handed part, and they have the same interactions. So his theory is, is symmetric under the exchange of parity. So it's a question then, is the universe really symmetric under parity? Is that a fundamental law of the universe or not? So when I was a student at Stanford uh, as an undergraduate, they had a little um, area with science uh, sort of displays that were sort of interesting. Some of them were experimental, uh, but I was a theorist, and one of them that really uh, attracted my attention was this theoretical one. And there was a plaque of metal that said uranium oxide, uranium in red, oxide in blue, and then there was a just it's very simple. It was a bar of lucite above it. You could look down from the bar of lucite, and when you look down from the bar of lucite, this is what you see. And it's very striking that the word oxide is still readable, but the word uranium is not. And what's the principle? Is, is uranium somehow affected by lucite? Well, no, it's just a written word, right? And it's not the red light versus blue either. It's because of the symmetry of the letters. That if I turn the, the, all the letters in the word oxide, if I turn them upside down, it looks exactly the same. But the letters in the word uranium do not. So you see, this, uh, the word uranium has a symmetry to it. Uh, so it does not have a symmetry to it, although the word oxide does. And so this is sort of, is the world like the word uranium, where if you do a mirror transformation, it looks completely different? Or is it like the word oxide, where if you do a mirror transformation, it looks like it's the same thing? Symmetry is one of the most important ideas in particle physics. Uh, and it's been a very fruitful uh, avenue to pursue. And so it's interesting to ask these questions. So a massless Dirac fermion, which is this, it has this, is, uh, conserves chirality because it's massless, and it also has both types of left and right particles, so it is parity symmetric. By the parity symmetric, inter symmetry will interchange those two branches, and it looks the same. On the other hand, a vile fermion has only one of these branches of the X. It still has chirality that it's the massless particle, in this case the left mover, all, all observers will agree it's a left-handed particle, but if I do a parity transformation, doesn't look the same anymore. So that's not, that theory does not have parity symmetry. So, and if you have a mass of Dirac fermion like this, then it is parity symmetric, because it's symmetric under that reflection, but because it's massive, observers won't agree whether it's left or right, and so we don't have a chirality defined. So why is this interesting? So Dirac gets the right theory for the electron, because it is massive, does look like this. And he described quantum electrodynamics perfectly with this. So why talk about bottle fermions at all? And why talk about chirality? Why talk about parity? Because should it be obvious that parity is a symmetry of the universe? And in fact, this is one of the beliefs at the time that was incontrovertible. It was like saying that the universe shouldn't be translationally symmetric or shouldn't be rotationally symmetric. It's unthinkable. And so because it was unthinkable, nobody thought about it. Well, nature had different ideas, though. So here's an experiment from 1928. It was like a year or two after Dirac's theory. 
This guy named R.G. Cox from Columbia and his collaborators decided, for some unknown reason, I don't know what it is, to take the electrons that come from radioactive decay, called beta rays, and measure their polarization. He wanted to see whether they were left or right-handed, or a mix of both. There was absolutely no reason to do this. Everybody knew that you get equal numbers of left and right, because there was, because if it didn't, then the world would be not very under parity. How would, how would this radioactive decay decide whether to only emit right or left if the world was parity symmetric? <coughs> so he measured it, and he found an asymmetry. And nobody understood it. And nobody believed it. And he had a hard time publishing the paper. <coughs> it was also very difficult technology for the time. So the data wasn't very clean. You could imagine reasons why it didn't work. But he was right. There was an asymmetry. But he was too early. He was 30 years too early. This is, he discovered a great thing in physics, but nobody understood it. So it was forgotten. So, uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, my senior year, we were required to do an advanced lab at the end to graduate. Uh, this is a lab where you can take an experiment that's from the literature, but not a canned experiment that already exists in the lab. And you have to build it from scratch. You get help, um, and you have to do it. So we decided we'd do this experiment. This is, we weren't married then, and we married some years later, and despite this experiment. Um, so being, we're both very theoretical, we decided we're going to improve upon it. Because one of the problems of the original experiment is that the electrons would scatter off the, the atmosphere. So what, what the experiment is, is you take a, a film of metal, a sheet of metal, and you polarize it. So the electrons in it are pointing in a certain direction, like a magnet. And then you take the beta rays and you scatter them off it. And if the beta rays are polarized, it'll make a difference whether, the, you polar, whether you magnetize the metal in this direction or in this direction. And so you measure how much scattering there was under the two magnetizations of the film and compare. And if they're equal, then the beta rays are not polarized. And if it's unequal, the beta rays were polarized. And so we tried to do that. But the problem is that the electrons can also scatter off the atmosphere. And that makes it sort of complicated. So we decided we'd be really smart. We'd fill our box full of helium. That would reduce the amount of scattering. And after about 24 hours, all of a sudden, the expensive phototubes we were borrowing from the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center sparked and were destroyed. <laughs> so. <laughs> went to Slack where we got the, these $2,000 piece photo tubes and said, there's something wrong with your photo tubes. So they gave us two new ones, which we destroyed in the next 24 hours. And then they gave us two new more. And after six, they decided to see what, the, what we were doing. And what happens is that in the photo tubes, there's a small separation between two electrodes that are 2,000 volt, have a 2,000 volt difference. And that's fine in air, but under helium, they spark. And uh, so they, uh, we graduated not because we succeeded in our experiment, but because they didn't want us to destroy anything else. <laughs> well, so 28 years later was the right time to talk about parity violation. There was some data in the meson that couldn't be explained in any other way. So uh, two young physicists, uh, Lee and Yang, proposed that parity was violated in the weak interactions. This is just heretical, shocking. It's like saying the universe looks different in one direction than the other. Uh, and it was true and they got the Nobel Prize. The experiment that confirmed it was performed by uh, Jin Chung Wu, who was a professor at uh, Columbia. And she did a beautiful experiment that was much cleaner than that old 1928 experiment. She took some cobalt-60, which is uh, uh, radioactive, and uh, she, uh, they put in a strong magnetic field so all the spins were aligned. And then they looked at its radioactive decay, and the electrons came out in one direction and not in the other direction. And that was a sure sign of their parity violation. This led immediately to thinking about, more thinking about the weak interactions. And that's where uh, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg put forth their great theory, which is a key part of what's now called the standard model, because it works so well. And they explain how weak interactions like this, uh, here I show how a neutron decays into an electron, an antineutrino, and a proton called beta decay. They show how that worked with the W particle that they hypothesized. And the key feature is that the fermions, the quarks, and the electrons, the neutrino that interact in the weak interactions are all left-handed. This is how the weak interactions break parity. The weak interactions ignore right-handed particles. Only left-handed particles participate in the weak interactions. And so they, it breaks the parity symmetry. And the chirality uh, of one type of fermion interacts weakly, and others do not. Here's what that theory looks like. It's, nobody claims it's beautiful. 
But the, and I don't want you to, I, so I didn't erase all the equations, I guess, but um, I don't need you to understand this. I just want you to notice that some of these particles have L's and some of them have R's on them. That's for left and right chirati. That's all the L's. And here are all the R's. You can just see, that just from the texture of this, that they have different interactions. And this is now an integral part of our understanding of the world, that left and right particles do not behave the same way. So the next chapter in the story is uh, called The Anomaly. And this is a picture of Hilbert's Hotel. Uh, it's a charming story. I recommend if you don't know about it, you can read about it in Wikipedia. Okay? He's trying to, he wanted to explain different types of infinities. And the story is, the basic part of the story is, you come to a hotel, you want to spend the night, but it's full. Every room is full. But luckily, it's an infinite hotel. So everybody gets out of the room and moves over one, and then there's a room for it. And the next person can come, and everybody moves over one, and there's a room for it. So actually, <laughs> you can't fill an infinite hotel. So then he talks about bringing in infinite buses of infinite numbers of people and so on. You can show that you can, there's a way of fitting everybody who comes to this hotel to fit in this hotel. So how does that pertain to particle physics? Well, suppose I take one of these a massless Dirac fermions, it's left and right-handed types of particles here, and I turn on an electric field. Well, particles move, if they have charge, they move in an electric field. They, if you turn on an electric field, that particle starts accelerating and starts zooming off. Well, so if you have some particles on a wire, a one-dimensional wire here, then if the particles are all moving to the right, then you can see that uh, they have to go up this curve here, because that means their momentum in the right direction, is getting, their momentum is getting more and more positive. So you have all these particles moving up here. Notice that uh, I now have a bunch of blue particles that are above the vacuum. So these look like real particles here. And they keep coming out of the vacuum. They come out of nowhere. And the more I run this electric field, the more I get. Meanwhile, these particles, these left-handed particles, are also getting more positive momentum, which means they're going down their line here and I'm getting fewer and fewer as they're disappearing into the vacuum. So you have this very strange thing where left-handed particles are surging out of the vacuum and right-handed ones are disappearing into it. So the number of left-handed particles and the number of right-handed particles is not being conserved because I have this infinite source for fermions, which looks like a Hilbert Hotel for electrons. So you can pull chiral fermion number out of the vacuum or you can dissolve it in the vacuum. This was a real shock when people discovered this in the late 60s. So I've got an increase of right-handed fermions, decrease of left-handed fermions. It's called the chiral anomaly. You can do this in three dimensions too. So suppose, but you have to also put in a magnetic field. Suppose I put in a strong magnetic field to a bunch of electrons. They start going around in circles. This is an effect that protects us from radiation from the sun. Our Earth's magnetic field captures the electrons. They spiral around. They come down and they look like aurora borealis in the sky. But they protect us. The magnetic field protects us, and it's one of the big uh, threats to uh, interstellar travel. If you want to go or interplanetary travel, if you want to go to Mars, you have to think about how are you going to survive the radiation when you're away from the Earth's magnetic field. So these electrons, if the magnetic field is going this way, the electrons are going around like this real fast. They can't move this way. They're stuck in their little circles. But they can move this way really easily. So they start looking like one-dimensional particles again, like particles on a wire. They can go up and down really easily. They can't go sideways. So if you look at the spectrum, it looks sort of like a complicated version of the one-dimensional fermion, where I have like a one-dimensional massless fermion. That's that x that I keep coming back to. And then all these curves here, which look like more massive fermions. Now, again, if I turn on an electric field as well as an E field, then I start pulling charges out of the vacuum, the blue ones here, or pushing it into the vacuum, the red ones. So you can create right-handed particles and lose left-handed particles. So this also works in three dimensions. There are many different features of this anomaly that I can't really go into. Um, one of them is that it explains the lifetime of the meson, the pi zero meson. Another one is that it puts incredible restrictions on the types of theories that you can create that are self-consistent. This wasn't known when Weinberg, Flasher, Weinberg, and Salam wrote down their theory, but there's this beautiful cancellation of effects in their theory that makes it not suffer from the problems that the anomaly can cause. So it's a, it's a good theory. Oh, sorry. Um, and, uh, another effect, uh, which I'll talk about briefly, uh, in condensed matter physics, there are things called vial semi-metals that show the anomaly. I'm going to mention two things here. One is that it pertains to the difficulties of putting the standard model on a computer. And the other is a cool effect called the chiral magnetic effect, which I'm going to just mention some 
very current topic of research about why this might be interesting in cosmology. So here we're going from studying the effects of particles on a small scale to how they might affect a big star. So I think that's sort of a thing just to mention. So suppose you have uh, what's called a red giant. It's a big star. It's at the end of its life cycle. It's burned up all of its nuclear fuel. And when it runs out of fuel, it starts collapsing under its gravitational weight very fast. It takes about a second to go from a giant star down to something very small. While it does that, the electrons getting squeezed and squeezed, and they get squeezed into the protons, and they undergo a weak interaction that turns them into neutrons and neutrinos. The neutrinos fly off, and the neutrons stay, and that's how you make neutron stars. But notice, because it's going through the weak interactions, and the weak interactions only pay attention to left-handed particles, all the electrons that are being eaten up are left-handed particles, leaving behind the right-handed ones. So uh, a hypothesis, then, is that after the sudden collapse in the presence of the star's magnetic field, you get one of these pictures here where all the electrons in the right branch have all been eaten up. They're gone. So that's why that red line is thin. It's unoccupied. But all the left particles are occupied here still. All right, I've got it backwards. The right ones are occupied. The left ones have gotten eaten. So the thing that's really weird about this is that uh, notice that for most of these states, they're occupied both for positive momentum and negative momentum. So you've got particles going both ways, which is sort of what you'd expect for a star that's standing still. It's got things moving around, but on average, all the momentum cancels out. But this branch here has all got positive momentum, and there's no particles on the other side with negative momentum because they got eaten by the weak interactions. So this theory, has, so this star has some currents, electrical currents going through it. Now, what's interesting about electrical currents is that they make magnet, that first of all, it's the amount of electrical current you have is proportional to the magnetic field. But then also, currents create more magnetic field. And so this thing is unstable. It creates more current, which creates more field, which creates more current, which creates more field. <coughs> and so this is a very strange effect that uh, has been hypothesized. Maybe the origin for some of the very bizarre neutron stars called magnetars, which have enormous magnetic fields around them. So nobody knows where the magnetic fields come from. So this is a new idea that people have suggested it might not be right, but it's an interesting thing that connects to the chirality and the anomalies. Uh, typically, stars are complicated things, so that's why some of these ideas might not be correct. But I just wanted to share with you some of the current ideas. Here's how uh, such things might enter condensed matter physics. Uh, here's a type of material that was discovered in the early 2000s uh, called graphene. It's basically chicken wire made out of carbon atoms. And it was discovered in a fascinating way. These two Russian physicists at the University of Manchester, um, this, they, their approach to physics is really great. They, they think it's like playing, OK? And so they always would keep Fridays for a day to play, a day to do something completely wild and crazy and nutty. Uh, one Friday, they came up with a way to uh, put a frog in a magnetic field and levitate it, uh, just for fun. So another day, though, they, which paid off really well, is they decided to take scotch tape and stick it onto graphene. That's the stuff that's in your pencil, right? And they peeled it off, and they looked under a microscope, and they, decided, and they discovered that they had made a two-dimensional film of carbon that people had been trying to make for ages, but they were trying to put it together from scratch, and they didn't know how to do it. But by peeling it off with scotch tape, which costs you know, nothing at a drugstore, they were able to make this new material which has incredible properties. And, and when you study the electrons in it, you find that it has an energy-momentum relation that looks like this. And at these magic points, it looks like the massless Dirac fermion. So we're not talking about relativistic particles anymore. We're talking about particles moving around in this little thin film. And then more recently, people have discovered how you can create uh, three-dimensional material by stacking layers. You can sort of engineer new types of materials that have never been seen in nature. That, are, uh, that have similar types of properties. And, they, and these things look like vial fermions. You can say the chiral magnetic effect. Now, not inside a big star, but inside a material. Why are these things so interesting? Well, if you have a vial fermion, uh, you only have right moving massless particles here. You don't have any left ones. So if it's moving like this, it can't run into something and bounce back, because there's no particles going the other direction. So this is uh, a magical particle that uh, goes right through walls, OK? It's got a current that you can't get rid of. So it's sort of like a superconductor, but it's not cold. So it's got this persistent current, which makes it have incredible uh, uh, electronic properties, which uh, uh, could be very interesting and might end up in some device in your pocket in 20 years. So the last section is going to be on computers 
personality and technology. So computers play an increasingly important role in physics and space because the theories we have are very complex and we want to know detailed answers for what they present. And while it's fun and possible in many cases to come up with very interesting effects by with just pencil and paper, a lot of the really interesting stuff that you want to get at, you can't do with pencil and paper, you need a high power computer. Mm -hmm. So in particle physics, if you look at that standard model again, I've circled the areas that involve quarks. And quarks involve, interact with this thing called gluons, and it's very strongly interacting, and it's impossible to calculate with pencil and paper what these things do. You have to do something else. And that something else is figured out by Ken Wilson, who won the Nobel Prize in 1980. He uh, asked the question, how would you put this theory on a computer? And that's actually it doesn't sound like a very profound statement, but it turns out it is because, you see, quantum field theories are full of infinities. They have infinite number of states going in the Dirac C, and infinite number of states above. You can't put anything infinite on a computer. So how you, and also it's got space time, and space time is continuous. How, you can't put an infinite number of points in space time on a computer. So you have to figure out how do you make this a finite system that you can study on a computer. And, and in doing this very elementary, answering this as an elementary question, you completely revolutionize how people think about quantum field theory. So basically, you turn space-time into a crystal, where instead of being able to move continuously through space, you have to hop from one site to another. So it looks very much how electrons hop around inside a crystal. And in fact, he made a very strong analogy between relativistic quantum field theory with quarks and gluons to ordinary condensed matter physics with electrons and photons. But one problem with this theory was that the quarks in this theory, you might try to set it up so that they're light. You need to have the quarks be very light compared to the scale of the crystal to describe reality. But you found that the quantum fluctuations destroyed that and made them very heavy. And you had to fine tune your, the parameters of your theory to extraordinary precision in order to keep the quarks light. So it really is a problem with the theory that was persisted for a couple of decades, and people didn't know how to solve this. The problem really can be traced back to this Hilbert Hotel. I described this Dirac fermion, which had this infinite sea of particles that could take fermions out of and put them back in. But there aren't any infinities on a computer. This is what a hotel looks like on a computer. It's really small. If it's full, when you get there, you're out of luck. You can't get in there. How do you describe this quantum field theory's behavior correctly when you only have finite resources? This is what a theorist has been doing with infinities the whole time. A computer can't do that. So this is actually where my own research came in in the early 90s, is to figure out how to solve this problem. It turns out that it's got a sort of an amusing solution. If you, if you take the Dirac equation and you solve it in empty space, you find you know, massive fermions moving along. But if you solve it in a space that has boundaries, with space like in this room with walls, you find that besides the particles that live in the middle of the room, which look like massive fermions, you find uh, that there are massless chiral fermions that are stuck to the walls. So there'd be a left-handed fermion running along that wall, and your right-handed fermion running along this wall. Well, so it turns out that you can throw this onto a computer um, where you've made space-time five-dimensional and say that our space-time is four-dimensional on the walls. But we actually live on, we're wall creatures, and these massless chiral fermions live there, and there are quarks. And it turns out you can use this theory to simulate uh, the world, and it's done all, all the time now. And the way the Hilbert Hotel then works is that if I apply my electric field, rather than pulling things out of an infinite vacuum, particles just sort of hop along from one wall to the other. And that's very surprising, because everything in here is very heavy. So you would think that by putting in so weak electric fields, you wouldn't be able to do anything with all these heavy particles here. But they're able to nudge each other over, just one little bit at a time. And it acts almost like a Hilbert Hotel, where a charge is able to make its way across the room and turn from a, a right-handed particle to a left-handed particle. There's no fine-tuning here, okay? But why is there no fine-tuning? How do I know that there aren't quantum fluctuations that'll just ruin this theory, just like Wilson's theory, and make those particles on the wall disappear and become heavy? Well, it turns out it's due to a branch of mathematics called topology. What's topology? Well, here's an analogy. Suppose I told you, I want you to draw a line from A to B, and I wanted to touch that black line once. And you have to do this while sitting in a truck going along the Karakoram Highway, the, the roughest part, okay? Well, so you try, and that's what you draw, because your hand's shaking. 
The bouncing over the potholes is the, are the quantum fluctuations on Wilson's theory. They make it very hard to reach that critical point where you've touched the line, which is the analog of making the fermion massless. But if I gave you this problem instead, where the A and B were on the opposite side, that would be really easy. You just draw anything that crosses the line, and it crosses once, exactly in one point. It doesn't matter where, I never told you where it had to cross. So it doesn't matter how bouncing the road is, it's really easy to do it. And it's easy to do because the A and B are on opposite sides of the line, and that's sort of the topology of the problem. And that's the analog for what's going to happen with these domain law fermions. There's no fine tuning here. I don't have to be careful because they could cross in one spot. So topology will do the same thing for the fermions. What's topology? Topology is the study of shapes. Okay? You want to make something independent of the shape. That's some, and under topology, this mug is the same as a torus. You see how that works. Uh, here's the deformation of the mug into a torus. It has the same shape if you stretch it. The rule is you can't tear it or break it. You can just deform it as if it's clay. You can't tear it anywhere. And if, if you can do that, we say that those are equal as far as their topology is concerned. So a mug, for example, has a different topology from a sphere, because I can't deform a sphere into a torus without tearing it. I have to poke holes in it to make it. So where's the topology of particles on a lattice? Well, it turns out that the momentum space is a torus. Now, that's sort of, it makes sense that it's a surface. If I told you I had a, a momentum in the x direction, momentum in the y, those are two coordinates. You could, you could call those coordinates on a surface, but why would it be a torus? A torus, if I can keep on increasing the y momentum, I go around that red circle. Why would I ever come back to the same state if I keep on increasing momentum? Normally, you'd say, the faster I go, the faster I go. I never, I can't go faster and faster and all of a sudden look like I'm still again. Well, on a lattice, you can, actually. That's sort of the way to understand that is uh, remember that quantum mechanics says that that momentum is related to the inverse wavelength of a wave. So if you have these two waves, this wave here would be a low momentum particle, and that'd be a high momentum particle. But if I'm restricting this thing to live on a lattice, that means I have to really I can't look at continuous wave. I have to mark it at discrete spots. And if I mark this at discrete spots like every <coughs> integer along that axis. The interesting thing is that those red dots exactly are the same for both of them. I can't tell the difference between the, the, the long wave and the short wave, which means I can't tell the difference between a low momentum and a high momentum particle. So when I increase the momentum, I come back to where I started, which is why momentum space on a lattice is a torus, which is called the Bruno Lamb zone, after a French physicist. OK, so that's a torus. That looks like something you might talk about with topology. There's something else, which is spin, the electron spin has an arrow which points somewhere. And it, because it points somewhere, it's like it points on the surface of the sphere. Because like it, its direction is defined by, can be defined by a dot on the sphere where this arrow touches. And so describing this particle moving around on this lattice is a description that involves relating the spin direction, which is on a sphere, to its momentum, which is on a torus. And it turns out that what's relevant is a map from the torus onto the sphere. And topology says that there are different ways of doing that that have completely that cannot be deformed into each other, and they're characterized by something called the winding number, which is an integer. 0, 1, 2, negative 1. So here's a I'm going to show you a picture of a way to map a torus onto a sphere that maps one torus onto a sphere twice. So here's a torus. We're going to turn that into a sphere or a soccer ball. The surface is going to have to pass through itself, but it never tears. If you look at it carefully, you'll see that that sock ball actually has two layers. That, that one surface of the torus turns, gets doubled over to make two layers in the sock ball. So that has winding number two. Now, why do I care about winding number? Well, it turns out that the um, that the number of the winding number determines how many massless fermions there are on the stuck to the walls. And that's very important because winding number is an integer. Integers are, the reason we use digital computers instead of analog computers is because it's, there's a big difference between a zero and a one. And fluctuations and of the current, whatever, won't change zeros to ones typically. It has to be a big change to turn a zero to one. So same thing here, a quantum, small quantum fluctuations can't turn winding number zero into winding number one. You can change things by a little bit. If it's a little fluctuation, that can't change big things like 0, 1, or 1 to 2. 
So in fact, the topological properties of the system are very stable against quantum fluctuations, which means the number zero modes are very stable. Now, the thing that's very cool is that this, so this is a construction now that's used to simulate QCD, the strong interactions, all the time. It's the lattice construction you put on a computer. So that sounds very abstract. But it turns out that these crystals that we're simulating on the computer to understand the strong interactions can actually be constructed out of normal materials in a laboratory, and they're called topological insulators. And they were actually discovered over a decade later, uh, after this was done for simulating particle physics, uh, in a paper by Kane and Bailey, where they discovered, they rediscovered something called the quantum spin hall effect. And this has opened up a whole bunch of research into these new types of materials called topological insulators. They look just like this system I showed here. In this case, it's a two dimensional film with zero modes along the bulk, along the surface, and currents that go through it that are topologically protected so that these surface modes can't be thrown away by quantum fluctuations. This sort of work has been based on older work on topology that didn't involve fermions. There is a, a, a Nobel Prize in 2003 for Abu Kaza who described how vortices work in, in superconductors that involves topology. And there was a Nobel Prize in 2016, including to my colleague at the University of Washington for their study of topological phase transitions. So this is a very big part of, of modern condensed matter physics, and by bringing in the chirality of fermions, it's taken us to the modern era of mm -hmm. uh, matter. And we now have a situation where condensed matter physicists are designing topological insulators of different properties that have different interesting uh, uh, electronic properties. And they're drawing pictures of Mobius strips and things that never used to be in part of physics because topology didn't used to be uh, playing a big role in physics. So, you should expect more and more progress on this. That we had a century almost of discussing chirality and understanding how it works, and we keep on discovering new things. It's affecting, you should expect uh, chirality and topology to play a big role in quantum field theory, astrophysics, material science, and quantum computing even. So, topology <coughs> and chirality is playing a role in how people try to uh, think about how they're going to do error correction on a quantum computer, for example. So, Expect more. <laughs> now, Salon wrote lots of papers on chirality. I just pulled off a few of his papers. They're very technical. Chiral compactification on Monkowski's cross the two sphere of n equals two Einstein Maxwell supergravity in six dimensions. <laughs> this is a hard paper to read, but he loved chirality. He talked about it in many, many different ways. And the thing that's sort of interesting I discovered was that. Toward the end of his life, he became very interested in whether <coughs> the chirality that we've been talking about at the particle level is related to the chirality I mentioned at the beginning right, that we see in nature. So he actually asked, is the chirality that you see in the, in the electron, is it related to the chirality we see in the snail? Well, how do you turn that into a science question? So what he asked was, we know that there are amino acids. There are left-handed ones, there are right-handed ones. And we see amino acids come from outer space that have, on a meteorites, that have the different chirality than what live, occurs in humans. Why did life choose one-handedness and not the other? Why is that snail curling that way instead of another? So, so he was sort of uh, interested in the idea that maybe his theory of the weak interactions could explain it. Because remember, the, the weak interactions at the fundamental particle level treat left-handed and right-handed particles very differently. So people calculated how much energy difference is there between a left-handed amino acid and a right-handed one due to its weak interactions. And it's incredibly tiny. It's 10 to the minus 19 electron volts. But people suggested that over long times in the ocean, for example, those small energy differences can make a slight difference and cause the world to go in one direction rather than the other. So one of his last papers in the early 90s was called The Role of Chirality in the Origin of Life. And it's not published in Physical Review D or Physical Letters. It's published in the Journal of Molecular Evolution. And he begins this paper with this marvelous quote from Descartes, which I think is marvelous partly because it ties together what I've been talking about this talk, but also shows how he approached physics in a very playful way. He said, any man who, upon looking down at his bare feet, doesn't laugh, has either no sense of symmetry or no sense of humor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful talk. Uh, the
floor is now open for questions. So if you have any, yeah. please raise your hands. <laughs> Hi, uh, lovely talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, this particularly being the Salam Memorial Lecture, Salam had also written about piracy violation before Yang and Lee. It never got published because uh, he got this idea, wrote it up, and sent it over to Wolfgang Pauli, who shot it down. And uh, said that, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that I, as someone had taken uh, the idea of salams to him, and he said, well, give my regards to my good friend Salam and tell him to work on something nice. I didn't know that story, thank you, but it's not surprising. The, the history is full of people who come up with great ideas, shown it to some grand old man who said, who pooed it and said it couldn't be right, and uh, put it aside, and, and history uh, regrets many of those things. So, if you really have a great idea and you believe in it, don't let it go. Don't let somebody tell you it's wrong. If you think it's right, just push on it and understand it better. I have heard lots of examples like that. Uh, so you, uh, you were talking about very beautiful, uh, about the flags. Uh, my question is that why parity conserve in weak interaction? I'm sorry, say it one more time. Why parity conserved in wheat in interaction? Why is it not conserved? What are the reasons for not conservation of the parity? Yeah, so we don't know. Uh, it's just a fact of nature that left-handed particles have weak interactions and right-handed ones don't. It's, it's, um, people have come up with theories where at high energy, in fact, there's the, the Pati Salam theory, where at high energy you do have parity symmetry, and then you have spontaneous symmetry breaking where the world has to decide which way it's going to go. Either left or right can have symmetry and the world has to choose left. So that's one possibility, but the Pati's Law model does not turn out to be right. It seems to be not in agreement with the experiment. So as far as we know, there is no intrinsic explanation for why left-handed particles... That is that uh, weak interaction is responsible for the beta decay and strong interaction. So the strong interactions don't violate parity. They treat left and right exactly the same. And so does electromagnetism. And so does gravity. But the weak interactions stand on that. We don't know. Thanks a lot of you for that. Next question. Hi, just a question in general. While you were at Harvard, did you study and take any course with Weinberg or Heschel? I'm sorry? When you were at Harvard, did you take a course with Yeah, I, I, I did. Yeah. You did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, okay, so my, my very, I, I've since had many interesting discussions with Weinberg, but when I was a graduate student, I came up with one idea. My advisor, Howard George, I said, oh, you should go tell Steve. He'd be interested in that. I was a second year student, and I was very nervous talking to the grand Steve Weinberg, and I knock on his door, and uh, I start telling him my idea. And within 30 seconds, he said, I don't have time for this sort of garbage. People come in my office all the time with their crazy ideas. I don't have time for this. So I go back to my advice and say, is that really necessary? <laughs> but I survived. You know, but he's, uh, they all have very different styles. So Glashow was this intuitive, brilliant guy who isn't very good at math. Weinberg is somebody who just takes a problem in the most direct way, which is often very ugly, but right, and then he just charges through it, through insurmountable obstacles. Nothing stops him, and he gets the right answer. And then uh, Salam is elegant, mathematical, but they all have a different style, and you need them all to make progress in science. Thank you. The next question. <coughs> If it's not the case, then let's thank Professor David Berkin again. Uh, Professor Dick Kaplan again. Thank you.